One of my Patreon supporters sent me a link to this post and asked what I thought of it. The post is headed, Where is the climate emergency? And it starts like this. Despite my asking over and over in a host of forums, to date nobody has been able to tell me just what this supposed climate emergency actually is and where I might find evidence that it exists. Here are some facts for the folks that think that the climate is a real danger to humanity. With the title and with that paragraph, the exam question is this. Is there a climate emergency? Well, let's have a look at what it says. Now, I don't use the term climate emergency on this channel. The evidence I've seen to date is in line with the position that climate change is a real problem and that we need to continue, because we've already started, we need to continue on our transition to zero carbon energy with some speed while avoiding stupid policies with unintended consequences. I don't define that situation as an emergency. As this piece itself says, an emergency is defined as a serious, unexpected and often dangerous situation requiring immediate action. I agree that the evidence supports that climate change is serious and requiring ongoing action, which has already started and in the process of scaling up. There's a difference between that and an unexpected, immediate and present danger when you need all hands on deck to protect life and limb. And I know that some of the campaigners will say, but that's exactly where we are. Well, it isn't. Because action on this needs to be done progressively over the coming decades. And you also have to do all of the other things that keep society and citizens together. Now, you can abandon all else to see to a short-term em emergency. You can't abandon all else for years and for decades. Put it another way. We have more people dying day to day in the world because of poverty. Do we talk about having a poverty crisis? No, we don't. It's killing more people now than almost anything else. We do work on alleviating it, and we should. The fact we don't talk about it like a crisis doesn't mean that we think it's acceptable. But we don't use the crisis model, which is drop everything, all hands to the pump. Not least because the most effective way of dealing with poverty is creating wealth. So, if this post sticks to that framing, we may well be in significant agreement, depending on the content. One of the issues is that the post doesn't set out the argument that it aims to rebut. We start without a stated definition of climate emergency. My understanding from those who use the language of climate emergency is that although people talk about current day impacts they believe are happening, it's the expected future impacts and the potential that we're putting ourselves onto an irreversible path to them that leads them to use that language. I don't see people arguing that the physical manifestations of climate change in the present day themselves constitute an emergency. And that's why a bunch of the memes here could be both true in terms of their data, but also strangely irrelevant if that's really the point that you're arguing with. Here's the first one. A graph described as global deaths per million population from climate and non-climate catastrophes 1920 to 2019. As you can see, the climate-related deaths per million have come down dramatically. Non-climate ones from earthquakes, tsunamis and volcanoes are low and have also slightly declined. It says, if you think deaths from climate-related catastrophes are an emergency, please point in the graph below to the start of the emergency. The framing here is that people who use the phrase climate emergency do so because they believe more people are dying today than they were before from climate events. But, you know, fair enough. If you have someone who assumes that, this graph would highlight one of the good news stories, which is that largely because of improved infrastructure, better planning and better advanced warning systems, deaths from natural disasters is significantly down. Next one. Storminess has not gone up. There's been no increase in hurricane strength or frequency. No emergency there. Again, this is in line with what the science tells us. On tropical cyclones, the IPCC says that tropical cyclone rainfall rates will likely increase in the future due to anthropogenic warming and accompanying increase in atmospheric moisture content. Tropical cyclone intensities globally will likely increase on average. 
This change would imply an even larger percentage increase in the destructive potential per storm, assuming no reduction in storm size. Modelling studies project a decrease or little change in the global frequency of tropical cyclones, so more powerful but not more frequent. Again, this graph therefore is only news to someone who's under the belief that in order to qualify for a climate emergency, there have to be increases in such events right now. There's going to be a few people like that. People who jump up and down when any weather event happens that's vaguely out of the ordinary. But that's not the bulk of people using the climate emergency phrase. Then there's one about droughts. A not particularly intuitive scatter plot. Rainfall trend versus annual rainfall. Even the IPCC says there's only one chance in five, low confidence, that global droughts are increasing. So we're still talking about the mainstream science then. Indeed, the models predict increases in the future in drought incidences and frequency, but so far the research doesn't see major current trends. This graph, for instance, from a 2013 paper showing the greater variability in droughts in the southern hemisphere and what might be a warming trend in the last decade, but certainly not pronounced enough to rise above the noise at that stage. The next graph is also about droughts. Droughts in the US have been decreasing, not increasing. You shouldn't spend too long focusing on specific regions in looking at climate change, because some will see more impacts than others from a global average temperature increase. This map, for instance, shows the areas expected to be the most affected by increased drought in a warming world. You'll see that the United States gets off relatively lightly on that estimation. But there are severe effects in large parts of Europe and Asia, including some of the breadbasket regions of the world, so consequences for everyone to some extent. And we saw some of this in action in 2017, a year where we saw severe drought everywhere except for North America. It's one reason why some of the less honest commentators in this area will, on some of the topics at least, tell you that you only need to look at the US data. They're cherry-picking certain measures that for the US alone tells a story that they want to tell. But climate change is a global issue. There's another one of these in this list as well, this graph about number of daily US maximum temperatures above 100 degree Fahrenheit. You'll see that very specific measure on a lot of the skeptic blogs. Tony Heller, for instance, constantly shows his own version. Average temperatures have been going up in the US and some measures more so than others. But the incidence of the hottest days, the above 95 degree days, those have been flat or if you include the high point of the Dust Bowl period, declining. So, of course, if you want to suggest that nothing's happening, that's the one that you show. However, apart from the implication that if there were a climate emergency, there would be increased droughts today, not just expected tomorrow, so far everything has been more or less in line with the known science. There's a bunch of others. No increase in the overall number of wildfires globally. I've explained elsewhere why I think that wildfires are not a good indicator of climate change because of multiple human-caused factors that can influence the outcomes. For instance, there used to be a lot more controlled burning, one of the reasons why this global burned area graph heads strongly downwards. And it's actually incorrect and misleading to suggest that graph is of wildfires. It's of total area burned, which includes from deliberate policy. Which doesn't mean that it's not a fair thing to do to push back against some of the mainstream media reporting about wildfires, some of which is genuinely alarmist. Some, not all. I don't know about that specific Time article, for instance. There's the graph on the astonishing reduction in global poverty that I've talked about on this channel numerous times, it's an illustration of the point that runs throughout the book Factfulness by the Roslings. In the last 50 years, bar the last couple, social indicators of progress have been moving massively positive worldwide on a majority of measures, including on poverty. But on key environmental measures, the situation has been the exact opposite. And while there's nothing inevitable behind either, over the last 50 years, there's been some degree of cause and effect going on there. And as this meme shows, 
that expansion and development did indeed come as a gift from the use of fossil fuels. As we began to utilise more energy to do useful work, to liberate people from the tasks that had formerly fully occupied them, mostly working on the land. I recognise that in my video celebrating the historical role of fossil fuels. As we move beyond them, we should wave them a fond farewell because we couldn't have got to where we are today without them. It's not quite the same as saying that it's the nature of the fuels themselves that they remain necessary for the future. We now have a lot of options, even if politicians are prone to ideological judgments on them sometimes and are prone to making mistakes and others. Now here's an item with some more substance. A graph that purports to show what many fondly believe, that all the wacky climate models are just massively predicting more heating than is actually happening in the real world. Let's look at this specific instance, because it does look highly persuasive at first glance. The text that comes with it. Climate models have routinely predicted far greater warming than has actually occurred. And obviously the graph is presented as the evidence. Let's look at the detail of this graph. It's put together by a noted sceptic, Roy Spencer. As I always say, we don't embrace nor reject information and arguments because of where they come from. We evaluate the evidence that's underpinning them. This isn't global average temperatures, it's global sea surface temperatures from 1979 to 2021. When you get a very specific measure like that, it should always provoke your curiosity. If all the models routinely show too much warming, why are we looking at this specific measure rather than a series with lots of different measures? We can see that the models here are the CMIP6 models, which are the newest generation of models, very much in their first run of results. And we see that this graph is 68 model simulations from 13 models. Now that seems rather odd, because you'd expect to get one line each from each of the models. Not multiples, because otherwise you run the risk of giving undue weight to a small number of the models. So what's behind all this? Well, there are two things that emerge if you look deeper into this graph. Nick Stokes pointed this out on his blog, that 50 out of the 68 model simulations of this graph come from one model. 50 out of 68. I don't know how you could justify that. And it happens to be the one that's showing the high sensitivity. If you highlight all of those runs from that model, you can see how they skew the balance of the whole significantly upwards. Remove them or just reduce it to a single run and the difference between the models and the observation is then massively less. Second, to come back to the question about what's being measured, there's a difference between ocean sea surface temperature, which is what the observations are measuring, and surface air temperature over the ocean, which is what those model runs are predicting. As I discussed in my video on humidity a while ago, ocean surface temperatures used to be measured by ships and then were measured by buoys. But the difference in height above the surface where the measurements are taken makes a difference. Because the CMIP6 models are new, they're only in the process of running predictions for the sea surface temperature. They're to come. Climate scientist Zeke Hausfather also pointed out that there are more models available in the CMIP6 stable and they support Nick's point. The can -ESM runs are a clear outlier. The rest of the available ensemble is doing fine. We know there will always be aspects of the complex global climate that are hard to model. So we should look to their results with curiosity and genuine constructive scepticism. But this meme, which purports to show that they're just wildly off and presumably the people running them just don't care, that is demonstrably dodgy. And I hate to say this, but you'd have to think that it's deliberately so, given the nature of the distorting factor, which is disappointing if true. Then we have this one. There's no sign of the fabled sixth wave of extinctions. That's a reference to the sixth mass extinction, comparing a purported major extinction event that may be starting right now and drawing a parallel with the great extinction events in geological history. Since they saw 70 to 95% of all species wiped out, we rather hope not to be starring in one of those. I did a video of my own explaining why there's no current evidence that we're in such a mass extinction, why certain outlier scientists argue that we are, and all of that. But this is arguably off topic, because nobody's arguing that recent species extinctions are down to climate change. 
for most pessimistic researchers in this area, believe in larger numbers going extinct worldwide because of habitat destruction. The graph doesn't tell us as much as it purports to, because species are only rated as having gone extinct after no individual has been seen for 50 years. So you get a massive lag in the figures for that reason. But in any case, although some campaigners will carelessly conflate the two, unless you're talking about them specifically, this doesn't result to a climate emergency one way or the other. Then we have this one. Increasing CO2 is causing increased plant growth all around the globe, which is increasing the food supplies of humans and animals alike. I covered this in my CO2 is plant food video, and what's presented here is half true, but extremely simplified. The true part, the increase in CO2 has led to a degree of additional fertilisation, leading to increased greening in parts of the world, Studies show that quite a bit of that additional greening was actually due to the reforestation in India and China, but nevertheless a significant amount from CO2. The implication is that that's all upside and everyone's eating better. Which is a bit of an overstatement. The growth of additional green matter is only effective if it's matched by an increase in nutrients. When people talk about plants in greenhouses being fed high levels of CO2, those plants are also being given optimal nitrogen and other fertiliser inputs. In the natural world, the absence of such additional fertiliser means that the green bulk produced can be reduced in terms of nutrition. And that can also include human crops. In any case, studies suggest that it's not an effect that keeps on giving. And such impacts don't offset expected future increases in global temperature, which start to reduce yields to differing degrees. I give more detail in that video. So this meme is just a cartoon level simplicity among the lines of CO2 is good for you kids, which is not much of an argument in itself. Then we get to a bunch of memes based on dumb things that alarmists say. These are the dregs. Because if you're going to identify a large body of people that you decide to lump together as one cohesive group, then you're going to cherry pick the worst things that some of them have said. Then you're going to be able to show whatever you want to show. Both sides could do it. Various skeptics have predicted that temperatures would fall rather than increase. You know, you could pick all those out. The people that said there was nothing wrong at all before disaster struck. It would be just as meaningless, although perfectly entertaining to do it that way round. So we get this one, a long list of all the dumb predictions anyone ever made that all get lumped together. None of them are sourced, some of them I recognise and are accurate, some others I recognise and are misrepresented, a couple of them are actually true. So an accurate one. In the early 1970s some people were predicting the onset of an ice age. Yes they did. And they were amplified by the newspapers at the time. If you look at the published peer-reviewed science at the time, there was still a majority of papers that were looking at global warming, although there were certainly some that were looking in the other direction. So what? Some people were right, some people were wrong. Shocker! When you get a disagreement in the scientific community, as we had then, whichever side turned out to be right, you could point at the other side. Then a misrepresented one. Maldive Islands will be underwater by 2018. There are no scientific papers that predicted that. There were a couple of newspaper articles which misquoted the science and made themselves ridiculous. If you want the detail for that, that's covered by Potholer54 on his channel. And then one that was actually true. Acid rain kills life in lakes. Well, yes, and it did. I covered this in my video on acid rain, and while there was lots of scaremongering from campaigners and others about forest dieback, the bit that was definitely supported by the research was that acid rain had a very negative impact on aquatic environments. So they misfired on that one. They used the wrong fake headline. Here's another one. There's no sign of the 50 million climate refugees by 2010 confidently predicted by the United Nations in 2005. This is similarly random. See, I don't think anyone suggested that the conditions of there being a climate emergency would only be met if there were 50 million climate refugees more than a decade ago. 
However, prediction is attributed to the United Nations in 2005. Well, the UN is not a scientific body and there's all sorts of odd characters that say weird things in its name. So it's not obvious what this would prove. The original quote is hard to track down. Apparently, it was quoted from the United Nations University website, which said... Amid predictions that by 2010, the world will need to cope with as many as 50 million people escaping the effects of creeping environmental deterioration, United Nations university experts say the international community urgently needs to define, recognise and extend support to this new category of refugee. Apparently, when the comment began to get attention, it was removed because people were taking it as a formal prediction of the United Nations Environment Programme, UNEP, and it wasn't. So it's just playtime for point scorers, really. Random people, even ones associated with big worthy bodies, saying random things isn't much more than parlour games. Also in that category is the polar bears one. Al Gore talked about polar bears. There were 7,000. Now there's only 30,000. Again, I talked about this in my video on polar bears. And it's absolutely right that there are some valid, although not wholly future-proofed, kickbacks against claims about disappearing polar bears. It's a bit misleading to use the figures that they do here because the majority of the recovery came because there was a ban put on the hunting of polar bears, which was why the numbers were so low. But, you know, Al Gore said a thing. And by all means, make that your target. Fair enough. Mock for politicians all you like. But it's a bit off topic for what this was supposed to be about. Then there's this one. An oldie for sure. Honest people, including IPCC officials, have admitted that the climate emergency is just an excuse to redistribute global wealth. Again, if you can represent the random opinions of individuals in large organisations and jump on whichever outlier opinion as being the secret truth of how the organisation really thinks, someone's always going to give you fodder for that. This one is being quoted 11 years after it was said. You'd think there'd be something more recent than that, if this really was the secret settled intent of the organisation. Seen in context, his actual argument was about how the poorer parts of the world that hadn't benefited from all the development from fossil fuels needed an injection of technology and support for them to continue to lift themselves out of poverty and so on. There are valid arguments about fairness between nations given the unequal historical contribution to climate change as a problem. And you can argue it both ways. What they aren't is some thin veneer for a global plot to redistribute wealth. I mean, don't get me wrong, there are plenty of people in the world on the left who would work for that as an outcome. Global redistribution of wealth. Some of them would enthusiastically leap onto the idea of the climate crisis as a vehicle to advance that aspiration. That's about what we do about the problem, not about what the science actually says. Random quote from an environmental economist from 2010 doesn't really add to our understanding of the dynamics of that. All right. That's nearly all of them we ploughed through. For people who read this blog that this comes from, find all of these highly innovating and persuasive. All in all, it's a bit disappointing if you're looking for the bringing together of all the best killer facts to represent your side. The ones that are true are being misrepresented as to what they mean or put up against a straw man version of why some people argue that there's a climate emergency. Some are not true including the graph about the performance of climate models, which is probably the most substantial one of the series. And some, like the, hey, people said dumb things in the past, are really in the so what category. Let the person who never said a dumb thing in their entire lives be the first to throw stones. I think it's a shame because you could probably produce a highly focused and factual critique of the people lining up to declare a climate emergency. Scientific American magazine was one of the most recent, declaring in a seriously pompous way why they'd come to the conclusion that this was its solemn duty. And some of the supporting evidence they provided was risible. The vehicles of campaigners pretending to be science and Scientific American took them at face value. You could have made hay with that. But instead, this was a tepid meme soup where you just threw all the shabby leftovers into one giant pot. Not to be confused with grown-up discussion. Mm -hmm.